Oh, and we are recording it as well. So if you have any objections for this being recorded, leave now or forever hold your peace. I'm a little concerned we are missing one panelist, aren't we? I've sent her a message. So good morning, everyone. Good day, good afternoon to those online. My name is Manisha Thomas, and it is my pleasure to be moderating this session today on humanitarian leadership on collective AAP, or accountability to affected people or populate people approaches. Are we heading in the right direction? Um, for those of you online, I do invite you to please introduce yourselves in the chat. And we also have a question and answer function in the webinar uh, for those on, in Zoom. So I will be looking at both of those to be able to bring you into the room. And for those of you in the room, I can call upon you to ask questions in person. Um, and I see we have somebody from IOM Cambodia. Thank you for introducing yourselves. So before we get into the program, I'm going to slightly change things around and see if we get more people in the room because we are in a different part of the main HNPW venue. So we're scared that people are over there looking for coffee or standing in the very long coffee line. It did happen. So I will just drag out my introduction a little bit more. <laughs> so um, today is also the official launch of the pilot of the interagency accountability to affected people training package for in-country leadership that was developed by members of the Interagency Standing Committee Accountability to Affected People Task Force members. Um, and the initiative was led by IOM, the International Organization for Migration. And our panelist who is joining us says she cannot log in, nothing is working. Could you send me the link, please? So if you can maybe send it to me and I will send it to her directly, that would be great. One second. So I'm going to multitask here as I try to do that. Uh, I don't guarantee that I can do that. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to introduce you first before we kick off with uh, the introductory video from Ugochi Daniels, who is IOM's Deputy Director General. I'm going to take the opportunity while our last panelist joins us to introduce the rest of the panel that we have here. Uh, we have Fran Celestine, to my right, who is IOM's Chief of Mission in Somalia. Welcome, Fran. Thank you. And Fran was also involved in the development of, or the development in this advising in terms of the training package. We've got Daniela Popovich Afendic, who is UNHCR Slovakia Head of Office. Welcome. And then we have Christine Parko, Chief of Mission for IOM Cambodia, and you were also involved in the training package uh, development. And I'm just trying to get the link for the other panelists. Uh, is it coming by email or is it coming by WhatsApp? Right. Email, okay. I will keep refreshing so that I can get there. Uh, da, 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 da. Oops, sorry. And then we have uh, Jesse Wood to my left, who is Chief of Emergencies and Transitions Policy and Program Department at the World Food Program and is also the IASC co-chair, the no, co-chair of the Interagency Standing Committee Task Force on Accountability to Affected People, which is IASC Task Force 2. <laughs> <laughs> and second to last, because the last one's online, we've got Alan Kalma, who is the Global Humanitarian Coordinator for the Lutheran World Federation and a member of the CHS Alliance Board. And then the panelist who's going to be joining us, hopefully, is Gwen. There she is. She's Gwen Lewis, who is the resident coordinator in Bangladesh. Welcome, Gwen. And sorry about the technical challenges, but great that you could join us. 
And so before we kick off with the session today, we are going to have first a video introduction from Ugochi Daniels, and she couldn't join us today, as I said, the Deputy Director General for the International Organization for Migration. Then we're going to have Christy, who I forgot to introduce, I apologize. <laughs> That was Christy, who's been behind much of us. Christy Bacal Mayancourt, who is the Interagency Accountability to Affected People Project Lead at IOM. And Christy is going to give us an overview of the interagency project and the training package that's been developed. And then we're going to turn to our panelists to get some answers to some questions before we turn to the rest of you to ask them questions or comment. So with that, we're going to have the video from Ugochi Daniels, if, I, if that works, please, IOM Deputy Director General, to officially launch the package. Dear colleagues and friends, Accountability to Affected People, or AAP, has been part of the Humanitarian Reform Agenda for over two decades, and it's reinforced by the Grand Bargain Commitment. As a former resident coordinator, I also feel really personally connected and committed to this subject, given the mandatory responsibilities of humanitarian country teams. And just to share a personal story, I'll never forget when I was in Nepal and I was in one of the remote mountain districts. We had just finished one um, mobile health camp specifically for women and girls, and we were moving to the next site and walking through the village. and. Obviously in Nepal, especially in remote areas of Nepal, I'm very noticeable. And there was a lot of commotion um, as I was walking through. And I noticed this woman at that particular point in time, she was backing me. Um, but when I got to her, she turned uh, to face me. And then I could see that she was blind and that she had um, an infection. Um, in her eyes, she turned to face me and said, can you help me? And at that point in time, I couldn't help her because we had our, our mobile um, health camp had closed and was moving on to the next site. And even though it's a health team, uh, predominantly for women and girls, for basic infections and common diseases, it provides um, public health services to the general population. So she could have been served if she could have accessed, um, accessed the services we were providing. And that shows exactly what happens when we don't take into account the most vulnerable um, in communities and have systems that reach and communicate with all of those who need the really, really important work that we do and the services we provide. So yes, Accountability to Affected Populations, AAP, it's yet one other acronym in the work that we do, but I want you to think of it in the lives of, the, of people, the people that we serve, the people who most need our services, because we can help them and we should help them. And this course and training is a reminder of how you can do exactly that. While progress has been made, challenges remain in holding the humanitarian community accountable effectively and in raising community voices to steer the humanitarian response towards people-centered priorities. We need to improve our collective action to the people we serve and protect them in crisis. And this starts by listening to them, as well as engaging them in prioritization and decision-making processes with the full engagement from our leadership. In the absence of substantive changes to humanitarian programs and our collective response, these efforts can be perceived as mere symbolic gestures rather than genuine attempts to address community concerns. So we have to remember that in the eyes of the people affected by crises, we as international actors are all the same. In most cases, affected communities do not make a distinction whether we're working for a development or a humanitarian um, program or project. For too many of them, we are their lifeline to lead them to recovery. 
So in practical terms, we've learned that um, complaints and feedback mechanisms or hotlines can become mere fixtures that are unappealing to communities due to our inability to course correct. A decrease of complaints doesn't mean we're doing a good job. And in fact, it may mean that they have lost trust in the humanitarian system and structure. So we need to raise our bar collectively. Our agility in humanitarian programming can facilitate durable solutions guided by voices from the communities and our local partners who represent the communities. Today is only the beginning of greater tasks at hand with this new pilot of the interagency AAP training package for in-country leadership developed by the IASC AAP task force members. This is the result of great collaboration with all partners in the localization, gender empowerment, and PSCA, and with donors, combining all the resources for the purposes of the people we serve. I know you're going to have a fruitful discussion today and learn from our leaders and champions in the country offices. I count on each of you to champion yourselves and go beyond boundaries in the pursuit of meaningful AAP approaches. We're here for the people we serve. They are the ones who remind us why we exist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, she's not there, but somebody will pass my thanks on to her. <laughs> Making a video, it's a bit strange, but um, so I think that's, you know, it's a good reminder that we talk about accountability to affected people a lot. We've been, as, as Ugochi said, it's been more than two decades and yet we're still not quite there yet. So what is it that we really need to change? And leadership at the country level is one of key, is, is a key element in ensuring that we are accountable to affected people, which is part of the reason why we have this new interagency training package. And I'm gonna to turn to Christy, who is going to give us an overview of the project. Christy, please. Thank you so much, Manisha. Okay, okay. Not very tall, so. <laughs> so um, I'll be presenting briefly on this interagency project that we have implemented under the um, the IASC AAP Task Force Work Plan. Um, before I go there, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the panel for agreeing to be here uh, and to to participate. Um, some of the members are here uh, of the project steering committee who has been instrumental to make this project um, possible and uh, to happen. Um, a special shout out I would give to Catherine Harris of UNHCR who pushed me uh, with this crazy idea um, to do this project uh, in 2021. Um, shout out to Anahi who's been a pillar uh, of this um, project, where are you? And Savi, beside her, um, our instructional designer, um, Valeria Reliesa, who has pulled all nighters, all nighters, um, uh, to finish this project on time. Matthias has been a great support, um, and of course, uh, DDG Ogochi for the great support that she has given to this project. To start this project, we needed. Uh, committed AP specialists who adhere to the ideals of the collective approach. Some members of the AP task force signed up and they committed uh, to be in the project steering committee. So you would see all the logos there. Yes, they're from that organ from those organizations. And then we needed to do a to have a baseline to be able to understand what knowledge gaps we are dealing with. Um, and what challenges the leadership faces that can be overcome. So we conducted a global survey in the first quarter of 2023 and received um, 87 responses from in-country leaders from at least 25 organizations in 70 countries covering all regions. Over half of the respondents are members uh, or members of the HCT or the humanitarian country team. Now, whether they are HCT members or not, it was um, a vital data information because the mandatory obligation for a collective approach to AP is explicit in the HCT compact. We also needed to understand more 
about the agency level priorities, um, agency level AAP priorities rather, that are often strongly um, aligned with the organizational mandate. And of course, the ideals of a collective approach on AAP. So I'm gonna browse very quickly on the survey results. Um, and so in their roles as HCT members, responders said that the HCT is performing well in AAP through the cluster system and interagency uh, inter coordination. However, the same responders um, wearing their agency hat answered that their organization performed poorly in AAP in the cluster system and interagency coordination, but did very well in program implementation and design. So then we ask, does being a member of the HCT matter in delivering a collective AAP approach? And according to HCT members, dedicated AAP budget resources or budget is just secondarily important to overcome the obstacle to delivering mandatory collective AP. However, the non-HCT members clearly disagree. Budget AAP first, then we will need the tools, then we can do the training. Where all the respond responders converged was on the main topics of interest for the training on collective AAP. And that is to give practical examples of AAP at the leadership level. In the individual interviews of more than 30 uh, in-country leaders, we also gathered that they needed practical advice on AAP interlinkages with other mandatory obligations such as protection, GBV, PSEA, disability inclusion, and those emerging topics like localization and the triple nexus. So after 18 months of consultation, um, I captured this last night with my phone. So it's kind of basic, the video. Um, so after 18 months of consultation, workshops and four rounds of review of extensive review review with a project steering committee and additional members of the isc um, aap task force <laughs> like mercy corps <laughs> fao and unfpa we came up with an online course and set of tools to pilot from now until mid-summer so the training is accessible via the un system staff college platform um, it will be available I think in a couple of days to be activated. And the eCampus platform, um, I think this is more convenient for those who do not have the UN accounts. Um, it's already activated, I think, yes. Um, you can have a sneak peek um, by scanning the QR code of that roll up outside at the entrance. Um, you can click the button to access the training. So for this week, we start with three modules. Modules um, one, uh, the overview of AAP. Modules 2A and 2B that were uh, more on the localization and um, long-term solutions. And then to be followed by modules 3A, 3B, 4A, and so on. So since this is still a pilot phase, your feedback is quite valuable so we could adjust and improve. Um, so a sneak peek how it looks like is, for example, this less text, interactive and engaging, self-paced, short. Some modules would be 10 minutes, some would be 15 to 20, that's the maximum. And accessible <laughs> online and offline using mobile devices like smartphones and tablets. Um, the tools are also downloadable. So for example, here, it's about the timeline um, or the history of AAP and what are the relevant documents. They can click on the year and they will be able to find the relevant documents. So the source of obligation as we would call it. And of course, it was important to us that, you know, the training would resonate to the target users. So we gathered the videos of um, 
actual in-country leaders to share their experience, to speak from personal experience about championing AAP and collective AP. And here we used existing videos, like as from Mark Cutts, uh, thanks to Ocha for sharing that video. Um, and then it was important for us to give practical examples. So scenarios and case studies are available in this training. So it's anim an animation and they give a scenario. And then of course the, the target user can engage and be inter, uh, you know, use the interactive training and answer some quiz. So it's not the, the typical like long text kind of training. So we tried our best. <laughs> so um, that's what I'm presenting for now. And we hope that there is some support uh, coming from the organizations uh, to promote um, in your respective organizations for your leaders to take the training or two, which will be super important for this pilot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. And for those who are not in the room and can't scan the QR code, are we going to drop the link into the chat yes. for those who are online? Yes. Since they won't be, or the, we're, we're sharing, we're, we're going to share them. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And just for those who don't know, Mark Cutts was the Deputy Humanitarian Coordinator in Gaziantep, where that video is from, yes. is what I'm guessing. So yeah. you'll, you'll actually get to hear some very practical examples. And we had Mark on a panel on AAP last year at HMPW, or maybe it was the year before. But he was talking about some of the initiatives, so those very practical examples of how you can put accountability to affected people into practice. With that, I encourage you all to go use a course, provide the feedback. Is the feedback available like is there a form for the feedback or yes so when they actually take the training it's mandatory they fill out the feedback form <laughs> so you gotta this work is the pilot it. yeah <laughs> so they get the badge like you completed the congratulations you completed the training but we need your feedback so, you can download. <laughs> so it's not a free thing <laughs> no there's no free lunch <laughs> But it's going to be good for making sure that your operations do better as a result. So great. So I encourage you all to go do that. With that, I'm now going to turn to our panel. And uh, since we've already introduced everybody, um, although Gwen, I'm not sure if you got to hear my introduction, but I will introduce everybody as we go along. So Gwen Lewis is, as I mentioned, the resident coordinator in Bangladesh. And Gwen has been around like me working on accountability to affected people for several years and we were involved in some of those early interagency standing committee commitments that the interagency standing committee principals, the heads of agency, made back in 2011. So Gwen, as someone who's been involved with accountability to affected people in various roles over the years, what's your assessment of the state of progress on the commitments to AAP and accountability accountability to affected people by crises. Are we going in the right direction? And if we are, is the humanitarian community, including heads of agencies of the IASC, the efforts under the grand bargain and donors, are we all doing enough to ensure that those efforts are sustained? Thank you, Manisha. And uh, sorry, I couldn't be there. I would have liked to very much. Um, as you said, we've been working on this uh, for a very long time and it, it's really great to see uh, that that commitment to accountability is still very much part and parcel of, of the, the work of humanitarians and I think a lot of progress has been made. I mean, just looking at the chat and the colleagues who have joined um, having people with accountability to affected populations in their job title um, was not heard of in 2011. So just that change and that the fact that it's such a, a core component of our work, I think, is really, really uh, important. Um, I think just the, the different elements of it as well and the, a greater understanding that it's not simply uh, feedback mechanisms and that there's a lot more involved to accountability, something that's been learned as well over the years, and um, that feedback mechanisms are critical, obviously, but so is communicating back on feedback, so is communications with communities, and that doesn't mean, again, one-way communication. Um, but really thinking through um, how, how, how we do better at hearing uh, priorities. I think organizations across the board, particularly in the humanitarian sector, are very aware um, and tools and guidelines are there. Um, a 
a high number of donors now make it a requirement in programmatic response at accountability mechanisms that are in place. Um, so I think there has been a lot of progress and I, it's important to acknowledge that. I do think that we still have a very long way to go and I think Ogochi touched on that as well. Um, and, uh, th and thank you for presenting and outlining the training package for humanitarian coordinator country teams because I think that's also something that will be very helpful. Because the sense I still have is that the programmatic response is still not designed based on community feedback. I think we often amend, adjust, um, re maybe reprioritize. I'm not sure to what extent we're really building that understanding on the basis of, of what the communities are telling us. I think we still, as humanitarians in particular, come in with, with very formulaic approaches. Um, I'm also not sure that um, we we prioritize interventions always on what the communities would like. And, and I think that becomes particularly challenging in a protracted crisis that we're facing now in Bangladesh with the Rohingya response, where, where you know we're facing cuts to food rations and to uh, wash programs and to protection. Um, and I know, you know some of the perceptions and the feedback from communities is that protection and security is their first concern. Um, but we're putting a lot more financing into keeping the basic food assistance and basic assistance in place. So I'm not saying that those things should be a choice, but I'm saying if we are to give uh, actual uh, decision making dignity um, to people that we are here to support, then I think some of those decisions and those choices actually need to be based really on, on a dialogue with, with communities. Um, and, and I think another challenge is, um, as as always, we we uh, you know donors request that those feedback mechanisms be in place, um, and we take it on board as an NGO or a UN agency to do to, to do that work. But just to give you an example, in in the Rohingya camps, we have 150 common feedback mechanisms, community feedback mechanisms, and you know that's great that NGOs and agencies have those mechanisms, but um, as a community member, you don't know which one to go to if you're complaining about a particular issue. So it's very confusing. And then in, on top of that, I'm not sure the coordination between these mechanisms is very strong. So it, it, uh, over time, what has happened is it, it breaks down trust because why would you go back to a feedback mechanism if you don't get an answer because it was the wrong one, it was the wrong phone number to call. Um, and so I think there's a lot of challenges there. We've seen some integration and we're really trying to strengthen that IOM, UNHCR and five big NGOs have pulled together and have one me mechanism now. And we've seen a, a, a shift in terms of, of not only complaints received, but the, the response. And I think we have to do a lot more thinking about how we coordinate um, those aspects. I'm gonna mention one more uh, challenge before I stop, because I think I've been talking for quite a bit already, but one, one of the other challenges is really from where I sit, we have a cluster system for humanitarian response. We have the Rohingya response with a million refugees, and we have a very significant development response. We do not have the same accountability structures and development response, and I really think it's missing component because a lot of the preparedness work that we do, a lot of the early warning work we do is with development partners, unless it's part of their DNA as well. And we're going to continue to have this very siloed approach and not really building it into systems and structures um, in advance of disasters. So I'll stop there, Manisha, um, back over to you. Thank you. Super. Thanks so much, Gwen. And I think the fact that there's so many complaints and feedback mechanisms still in the camps after so many years really does highlight that need for us to be working collectively together. And I think it's one of the things that has long been talked about is if you as a community member have to try to figure out where to go to provide feedback or a complaint, you're less likely to do that. So that's really incumbent upon us as humanitarians to be able to make sure that we're getting our act together to make it easier for those who are affected. And I think that point really about how do we make the link with development actors and get them to really have similar systems is really critical. And I think especially when we're looking at contexts where we're talking about the nexus and protracted crises, we're really going to have to find ways to, to bridge that gap that exists between the humanitarian and development sides there. When, I mean, during the consultations, as you heard Christy saying, with in-country leaders and country directors about 
you know, AAP, the role of humanitarian and resident coordinators in defining that overall approach to a collective, sorry, that overall approach to accountability to affected people was really seen as pivotal to the success of a collective strategy on accountability to affected people. I mean, you've already outlined some of the challenges, but what are some of the other challenges that you've seen for collective action for accountability to the people we serve? I mean, you talked about how you've got HCR and IOM and the five big agencies coming together, or sorry, five big NGOs, having that more common um, community and complaints and feedback mechanisms together. But why has it taken so long and what are some of the ways to overcome some of the challenges that you've seen? Um, no, th thanks. Um, I mean, uh, I think there, there's still not yet a common understanding of what collective AAP looks like. Um, and I, uh, you know, uh, this is this will be m my third attempt in the last two years at, uh, at establishing an integrated AAP uh, system, a common feedback mechanism in the camps in, in Cox Bazaar. And I think we're we're finally on the right track. When I when I raise it with the, the the humanitarian agencies working on the response, it's an immediate yes, absolutely, we have to look at a, a integrated AAP mechanism. Um, but when it comes down to the, the the nuts and bolts of it, it's really challenging for agencies to trust that complaints that are made against them, whether it's on SEA or on food parcels or on um, you know case management or on their staffing or whatever assistance program it is will get shared into a central location and then those complaints then will be processed and, and there will be a system in place. Letting go of that control is really challenging. Um, and so there, there is a, a you know a, a mandate issue, but there's also a trust issue. Um, protection colleagues say, but you're mixing this up with case management and we can't possibly you know share confidential information. So there's still a lot of unclarity between case management systems, between common feedback mechanisms and between SEA mechanisms. And um, again, I, you know, in an ideal world, I would like, you know, a system that is no matter who you are um, or where you are, it's accessible, easy to use. And no matter what your concern is, um, you, you would get a, somebody uh, on the other side of the, the line or in, 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 in the camp who will be there to talk to you and, and we'll get back to you with whatever um, answer they have. And that we're just a very long way away from that. And we're, we're still not putting the end user at the center of the system. Um, and I think that's really, really a challenge. And there are different policies. NGOs, UN agencies have different approaches, different policies on feedback mechanisms. And that makes it also um, a more complex. Uh, to give donors credit, they've insisted on that uh, AAP needs to be integral to all of the programs, um, um, but but um, there isn't system-wide financing for this work. They say, well, we financed you through the programs. Why are you why why do you need more? Um, and so, you know, having having some financing makes it a lot easier in my role to push things because if I'm not coming with any money behind, it's it's much more difficult. And so, we really need to get that collective agreement. Um, and we need to to uh, really do that in order to build trust, because, uh, uh, again, protracted crisis, seven years in, 150 plus feedback mechanisms, we're losing trust uh, with the communities. And reduced funds mean that I'm not sure we're making best use of the financing we have on AAP if we have 150 and 50 mechanisms. So, you know, and again, what questions are we asking? to allow, whether it's, you know, Bangladeshis uh, who have just gone through a major disaster, like, you know, last year there was 2.5 million people affected by natural emergencies in Bangladesh. The year before it was even higher. How can we make sure that we're taking the right approach, that we're supporting people the way they want to be supported, and we use the decision-making uh, in order to uh, mitigate a sense of despair, hopelessness in the camps, and also to empower people more in terms of, uh, of, of what they would like to see in their lives and, and how, how they would like decisions to be made. Thanks so much, Gwen. And I think that that point that we still are not putting people at the center is really the, the biggest challenge I think that we've got. We often talk about putting people at the center but we're just not there yet. And that element of needing the financing to really push and being more strategic about 
where we're putting the money and how we're using it and making it useful for people that are using those systems, I think is really critical. So thanks very much, Gwen. I'm gonna to turn to the other panelists and we will have time for Q&A. And those online, please do use the Q&A function so that when we come to questions, I can turn to some of your questions as well. So France and Daniela, you're both part of not humanitarian country teams, but a UN country team and a humanitarian country team. So you're part of um, in-country leadership teams. And we've seen that those teams can be crucial in creating and sustaining collective systems for accountability to affected people in crises. And we've heard from Gwen some of those challenges already. But from your perspectives, what are some of the main challenges to a collective accountability to affected people approach by UN country teams and by humanitarian country teams? France, I'm going to turn to you first. Thanks, uh, Anisha. Good morning, colleagues. Um, well, I'm, I, I don't want to repeat everything that Gwen said, but I uh, agree I'll, with her. <laughs> I agree with everything that she said. <laughs> there but there are three key challenges that I've seen, at least on the ground, uh, from my experience in Somalia, uh, and also when I was the chief of mission in Nigeria. Two big uh, operations, uh, two big humanitarian operations. It's lack of leadership and coordination. So it, it could be at the HCT level or even at the HC level um, where uh, we don't have a consistent approach uh, to AAP. Uh, you have resistance from individual uh, agencies. And it, it's similar to what Gwen said, because they are protecting um, their own agencies, not necessarily the people, um, and lack of clarity. So what you see, uh, 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 so many different approaches uh, including in Somalia, where we had, uh, we still have more than 200 uh, CFMs, um, and the people don't know what to turn to. Mm -hmm. uh, so, when you don't coordinate, you don't have leadership. We don't know what's happening. Uh, so, the response suffer. So, the, the quality of the response and coverage also suffer. And uh, um, so, this is what we've seen now in, in Somalia. And we're trying as much as possible to, to, to rein that in, those uh, 200 plus um, CFMs. And of course, AAP is not just CFM, there's more to it, but that's part of it. Um, we, we're in the process of creating what we call the aggregator, which is a, a system that, that uh, collects and analyzes uh, all of these um, uh, um, complaints and then, and then release them uh, or release them to the public as trends, but also uh, uh, send them to the agencies where they need to address them. That, that's one, one key aspect I think we're gonna try to resolve. The, the other part is a uh, challenge, I would say, is lack of resources or capacity. Um, uh, on the capacity side, because uh, a lot of the agencies, uh, they have increasing demand, increasing pressure, multiple crises, um, especially in a country like Somalia where we have everything. Um, and uh, uh, we have floods, droughts, locusts, and conflict all at once. Um, dealing with that, so the bandwidth uh, is reduced, um, and so you don't have the resources. Sometimes funding is an issue. And uh, speaking of resources, agencies competing over resources is actually detrimental to, to uh, uh, effective AAP uh, programming because uh, we're trying to hold on our, our, on our specific ones. Um, so on the, on the uh, leadership part, uh, if I may go back to it, and the, the multiple uh, CFM, uh, after five failed rainy season in Somalia, two months later, uh, flash floods all over the country. Um, we, the, the forecast told us that was gonna happen, and we broadcast that all over the country, especially in the river Rhine areas. We noticed that people would, uh, there are a lot of people who didn't move. Um, and we wanted to know why they did not move. Uh, well, that's uh, the, the last challenge I think we, we have is the trust and accountability that I see in the country because they didn't trust the information that was coming out. Uh, they don't know why it was coming out. So uh, lack of leadership and coordination, lack of resources and capacity, and lack of uh, uh, um, trust and accountability. Because as Gwen pointed out, and I think uh, um, uh, Ugo said the same thing, uh, if I keep complaining about something, and I see no results, why waste my breath 
and going back to you. Uh, so that's that's what we've seen on the ground. Um, so when you go to somebody and ask them if something is affecting them, you better be prepared to resolve whatever issue that is. If not, you uh, you provide them an answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, France. And I think that's really critical. I mean, both you and Gwen and Hugo as well said that, you know, that lack of leadership, that lack of coordination, the lack of trust. And it's interesting in the chat, someone said, I'm not sure, and I don't know if it was in response to you or Gwen, no, it was to yours. Even six months into an emergency is too late to talk to agencies about setting up common systems. Why haven't we developed a system that at the very beginning of any emergency response, OCHA sets up the common feedback system, or UNHCR in the case of a refugee response, um, then no one would be entrenched in their own systems and resistance to change, or resistant to change. And I think there's that lack of incentive, and we, we saw that also in terms of what Gwen was saying, but what you've said, France, is that agencies and that competition for resources is we're prioritizing our own organizations and not the people at the center. Daniela, I'm going to turn to you for your sort of experiences with challenges to a collective AAP approach by UN, the UNCT in Slovakia. Slovakia. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Manusha. And, uh, you know, just to clarify uh, a little bit on the coordination that uh, the situation in Ukraine, uh, among others, resulted in reshaping and strengthening the interagency environment in uh, many operations to effectively respond to the needs of, of uh, refugees. And in Slovakia, like in all countries that are neighboring uh, Ukraine and uh, are part of the Ukraine emergency response, uh, we use the refugee coordination model, uh, RCM, uh, that was uh, put in place uh, following the events of the February 2022. And here the UNHCR created a refugee coordination forum where all the partners from the UN sector and the NGOs and, and all the others are participating. But the important thing is that uh, this, uh, this forum is co-chaired by the government. So uh, it is co-chaired uh, by the Ministry, uh, uh, with the Ministry of Interior, particularly Migration Office. And uh, this I like to highlight uh, as the, the importance of this, this uh, co-chairmanship, uh, practically indicating that uh, what we're doing as humanitarians is we are helping, we are complementing the government efforts. And in some situations like the one uh, where I currently work, this is a de facto situation. Uh, we are there to support the government. Uh, and uh, uh, all other actors, uh, they are fulfilling that role, and uh, the coordination uh, and engagement is done uh, together with the government. Uh, to go to the challenges, um, uh, I think the value of these uh, panels and meetings is really that uh, we meet colleagues from different parts of the world, and then we chat and we realize, wow, uh, it's great that we actually identify the, the same challenges and uh, that we are on the same path. Because, you know, sometimes you worry, maybe this is only something that um, I notice. But I can see here that uh, all colleagues are basically uh, 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 mentioning the same challenges. And uh, one uh, of the main on the list of uh, that I have of the four challenges is also related to uh, resource allocation and, uh, uh, and I would emphasize also monitoring. Um, basically what happens is that uh, when we uh, always focus on setting the agendas, but then uh, for many of the issues we, uh, uh, we have to also ensure that there are adequate resources allocated uh, for the sustained community engagement and for the AAP. Like for instance, there are uh, uh, feedback mechanisms mentioned a lot this morning, but uh, uh, the monitoring of this effectiveness of the feedback mechanism needs uh, enhanced support uh, to ensure that these initiatives, they don't only exist, uh, but that they also thrive. And uh, one of the main challenges for uh, AAP, uh, while it's a responsibility of everyone, it is often not uh, uh, or insufficiently is sustained with human and financial resources, uh, uh, particularly for coordination and oversight. It's all about implementation, but it's very important to look into the coordination and oversight uh, capacities as well. Uh, and then, you know, like with that, uh, it is critical to ensure that uh, all relevant actors are meaningfully engaged, that they work in the coordinated matter, uh, manner, that uh, the complaint and response mechanisms are up to standards to allow uh, interagency referrals, and that the inputs from the affected communities are uh, effectively used to shape programs and that this is made visible. 
Uh, the second challenge I would say is the support for training uh, 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 and uh, AAP application by the authorities. Uh, the refugee response in Slovakia is led by the government and as I said, uh, our role as UNHCR and the overall humanitarian communities to effectively complement government uh, led efforts. However, main uh, uh, benefits and insights gained from our initiatives, uh, we have to provide also the ongoing support uh, to the local authorities and uh, uh, to the uh, humanitarian workers in general. Uh, this involves improving training programs, and uh, this is uh, actually mm -hmm. what we're doing now, uh, and uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, local actors are part of this program because they generally need uh, uh, to be capacitated. I would just quickly mention here also the, the need to advocate for the collective uh, AAP, collective uh, accountability uh, for affected population. And uh, uh, this was already mentioned by the colleagues, so I wouldn't go, but uh, maybe addressing the systematic challenges is something we also need to look to. Uh, it is imperative to remember that our work is centered on the on the human values, and that said, there are systematic barriers uh, to achieving truly people-centered uh, humanitarian responses, such as limited outreach uh, to vulnerable refugees in remote areas and those with communication or other impairments, and enhancing our presence and uh, our accessibility in these areas, as well as working jointly on AP, are therefore the imperative. Super. Thank you very much, Daniela. And it's heartening in a way to see that the challenges are common from the different places where you're working, but concerning that we still have those challenges so many years on. And we did also have the operational guiding principles and standards on collective community and feedback <laughs> mechanisms. I'm looking at you, Jesse, because it's, it's a mouthful on that one. I might ask you to come in on that one, but I, I think as one of those elements to help us better do CFM's uh, complaints and feedback mechanisms early on, I think, that is maybe a new sort of tool that could help us get there. I will come to you in a minute, Jesse, but I'm going to first um, turn to Christine and, and France because you were both involved in the development of the training as well as Daniela. How do you think that uh, humanitarian country teams or UN country teams and the cluster system can be more community driven and what role can local actors play in making these interagency bodies less top down? Christine, I'm going to turn to you first, and then France and Danielle, I'm going to ask you to keep your answers brief this time, next time. Thank you. Thank you, Manisha. Um, the ACT and the cluster system will need to ensure that the affected population or communities that are the center of the humanitarian response, and that we should have a collective strategies in place, and it has to be flexible to ensure that it is community driven, and as well as um, the communities participate in decision making and these priorities and concerns are addressed by HCT and um, the cluster system in a meaningful way. So I am coming from the Asia Pacific region and many of the members or the governments that we work with are the ones leading the response. So these are well capacitated um, uh, governments that can easily activate the response to disasters or conflict or any crisis. So I would like to focus my um, four considerations for today in terms of how the local actors play a very important role in, in the crisis. So first, the ACT and the cluster system will need to engage different groups in the community. And also the local actors will need to be a part of a joint preparedness and pre-assessment even before the crisis. And this was already mentioned a while ago. Why are we not doing this before a crisis? And the world now is changing so much. We were, many of the crisis happens unexpectedly and the government are also not prepared. So it is important that before a crisis happen, all the countries will need to be joining together in any assessment, um, preparedness, planning, and be able to understand existing capacities of the community as vulnerabilities and risk. Then second, we need to strengthen collaboration and involvement at the sub-national level. These are the local actors, the local leaders, the religious leaders, community-based organizations, NGOs, to make sure that they are involved in assessments, capacity building, planning and mapping, whether where is the evacuation center, what is the existing centers that we could use for 
for an evacuation site, and etc. And then use all this information from the local leaders to be able to provide and engage a better um, uh, awareness and engagement with the affected population. Third, we need. I'm looking at yeah, you. Good, yeah, good. <laughs> so third. Um, the engagement of the local actors is important in enabling trust and building relationship with the community because they are the one who knows the culture, the language, and the context of the community. So it's really important that we have to work with them. The HCT, the cluster system, will need to work with them and be able to utilize those capacities that are existing. So I've mentioned about pre-crisis preparedness. Because in my experience across humanitarian actions in Haiti, in Bangladesh, and in many countries I have worked um, on humanitarian crisis, external support or response takes time to arrive in a country. So in order for us to be able to activate easily a response, the local communities, the local leaders are already prepared, whether the integration of AAP, the PSEA, the community awareness, the trust is already there. Finally, the HCT and the cluster system must work closely with the local actors and communities so that we can be able to provide a direct response and be able to really target the needs of the population. So in case that we don't have access, whether it's restriction of movement or roads are inaccessible, you have already the local authorities, the local readers that are ready to be activated in any crisis. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Christine. And I think it's something that we've talked about for a long time, that preparedness and understanding what are the existing capacities, but our systems don't necessarily incentivize us to really use those and put people at the center. Um, France, I'm going to turn to you and Daniela just briefly. What are what do you think, in addition to what Christine said, are some of the what role can local actors play? Well, uh, certainly they need to be at the center um, because they understand the context. Um, they are a lot more agile than we are, um, and they can move, and not necessarily res restricted by, uh, if you are a UN agency, by the UN SMS system, the UN security management system. Uh, but we need to accompany the communities, uh, you know, so they can get out of their current condition. It's not us bringing um, ideas and indicators that were designed hundreds of miles away, but it's uh, uh, finding uh, um, solutions where they are. And if we're not talking to them, we're probably going to leave them behind because the solutions that we bring might not make sense on the ground. So accompanying the people uh, is extremely important. Uh, this is why community engagement is, is important. Community-based planning, as Christine men mentioned, uh, should be key to our programming and how we deliver on the ground. Let's amplify the voices of those who are affected uh, those we serve, um, and let's listen to, to them. They'll, they'll tell you what they need. Uh, far too often we, we, we come with uh, pre-cooked uh, ideas uh, that were designed so too, too far away, <coughs> and it doesn't make sense on the ground. Super. Thanks so much, France. And I think that is listening and really taking that feedback on board. Daniela, from your perspective, briefly, please. Uh, just not to, you know, like uh, repeat, uh, because I signed to many of these, to say that uh, if we want to engage uh, more local actors, uh, interagency bodies, they need to make meaningful participation easier uh, by lifting uh, administrative and bureaucratic burden, providing tailored technical support, such as uh, project proposal development, mm -hmm. etc., and leaving aside the jargon. Uh, uh, then, uh, just to add that in Slovakia, uh, local uh, civil society organizations and uh, leader, uh, representatives of the refugee-led organizations, they are part of the coordination mechanism. They attend uh, working groups and they are actively participating. And I think the next step should be, you know, like for all of us to look into better integration of the refugee advisory bodies in our coordination structures. And uh, uh, not to forget that when we develop the capacity of the local actors, we need to also look not in the capacities of uh, doing the job, but capacity of coordinating, capacity of also, because all these mechanisms for the accountability uh, uh, for uh, affected people, they also need resources. And one last thing, you know, which I think 
uh, is very simple but also often forgotten language for all our local actors to be uh, engaged into uh, coordination yeah. forums they need to understand uh, most of uh, our coordinations are done in English or other you know. so having in translation or now in the modern 21st century you know different apps that can facilitate this uh, can make a huge difference and we're talking about the simple steps so thank you super thanks very much and it is incredible also what you can do with ai and how you can get captioning and translations in, in zoom i don't know why we didn't do that for this one but that's another thing uh moving on um jesse and alan i'm going to come to you now and more from the global level perspective because jesse as co-chair of the interagency standing committee accountability to affected people task force. I'm really trying not to use acronyms, so it just takes longer. And Alan, as a board member of the CHS Alliance, what role does leadership play in ensuring humanitarian responses are accountable and people-centered from your from your perspectives? Jesse, I'll start with you, please. Sir. Thanks, Manisha. And uh, maybe I can just start off by, again, congratulating Christy and the entire team that's been working through that Workstream 1 uh, in the task force on the launch last night of the pilot uh, of the training. It's really impressive that it's come together and uh, I'm very impressed you're here and so wide awake this morning. I understand people were up until three in the morning working through some of the technical challenges. So uh, it's not easy, even though we sit here at the global level, we have our challenges as well. Um, yes, leadership. So, I mean, it's, it's obviously an integral element um, and maybe one of the key elements to ensuring that we can actually move forward with the collective agenda country level. Uh, before Task Force 2 launched um, two years ago, uh, WFP and IFRC uh, conducted a review uh, with uh, stakeholders across the system of the key constraints um, towards collective accountability. And uh, amongst others, leadership came out as, as one of the number one elements. And it's not to say that there isn't interest and uh, dedication and commitment amongst leadership. It's the, um, uh, it's the, it's the element of ensuring that leadership has the tools in place, the understanding to take action on that commitment. Uh, it can't just be a mandatory element of the, uh, the compact in an HC's uh, agreement, uh, but has to be, uh, they have to be enabled to uh, take that forward. And so we looked at you know, what would be necessary at the global level, uh, and the training that uh, this team has put together is, is an important component of that. It's not the only element of that, of course, because uh, it, you know, we need to actually look at what are the tools and practices uh, and some of the support that you've heard from the leaders today that's required to, uh, you know, to actually, um, uh, for them to take forward this agenda. So, um, yeah, no, I think, I, I think um, what I'd like to say there is just that, uh, Oh my gosh, I'm having a brain blank for a second. It's because he didn't get his coffee, it's because he very came true. on time. So I'm sorry about that. I'm, thank you very much. But anyways, no, just to say again, that I think we've heard today the, you know, the importance of leadership uh, to realizing the agenda. And we just need to look collectively at how we can enable that. And I know there's another question coming up where I can talk a little bit more about um, some of those elements that we can provide. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jesse. And hopefully we will all get some coffee after this. <laughs> I'll go stand in the line with you. Um, Alan, from your perspective, you know, what's the role of leadership? And I think that the challenge also that was mentioned from Gwen is, you know, you can have the leadership, but if you don't have the resources, and then also the systems around how organizations are maybe not able to do that. From your perspective, Alan, please. Thank you. Um, and good to see everyone, uh, you know, the energy is a little bit low, but I understand it's a coffee situation. <laughs> but just the fact that you showed up is a, it's a big thing. Um, I was counting and in this particular H&PW, there was almost like 50 sessions on localization and AAP. And most of them are simultaneous, actually. So thank you for choosing this one. Um, I think just, just and I, I think I'm speaking to the choir here, but the AAP is basically about shifting power, right? Um, it's, it's about us letting go about the power that, you know, we think we have um, over the communities. And when we did the global consultations for the revised CHS, um, one of the things that kept coming back from consultations um, with NGOs, but with also with communities, is the fact that people just wanted to be treated with dignity. Thank you for the food packages. Thank you for the NFI kits. We love the shelter, but we just need dignity. And dignity sometimes doesn't come in those packages. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that they, they, they want us to hear. They want to be part of the decision making. Um, they want us to break the mold 
we put ourselves into this box of what humanitarians can do in an emergency. And it's becoming more and more defined by donors and by the, you know, this, the, the environment that we work in. And we just don't struggle out of it. I think this is something that they want to challenge us on. Um, AAP is about letting, there was a question yesterday. When you talk about accountability and quality, um, who, who defines it? Who defines accountability? Who defines quality? And most of the time, it's not the people themselves who define it. We try to define it for them. Um, William from uh, Sphere mentioned yesterday, you know, if there's no dignity, there's no quality. So that should be the basis of what we do. Like, how do you focus on dignity to make sure that you have a qualified response? And this is where leadership comes in, because I feel that leadership is the cornerstone of accountability. Um, you know, CHS Alliance has been doing the sessions on leading well. And one of the things that we keep on saying, unless there's a change in culture, an organizational culture and how we approach the people that we serve, um, there's not going to be any systemic changes. You have very good frontline people who really have the passion for AAP and do their jobs. But unless there's a move from the leadership to actually drive the organization forward towards this direction, nothing will be sustained. Um, and then they move to another organization and then they have a different AAP culture um, or they define it differently and then it's also, so that's, that's one thing. Resourcing has been mentioned and I think that's really, really important. We always say and donors always say AAP should not be something we have to pay for because this is a responsibility of the organization. Yes and no. Like, you know, it, it takes a lot more effort to actually ensure that you have AAP integrated in your programming, which is why some agencies just do the checklist or tick box AAP, which is uh, not something we want to do. And so we want leaders to, to set the tone of the organization. We want them to lead by example. So, you know, when they come to, the, to you know, do their field visits, to actually talk to communities and not do it for the photo op. You know, and you know, two minutes, oh, hello, how are you? I mean, are you fine? How, are, how did we do? Uh, and then sort of like move on. Oh, our staff will take care of your problems. Um, to really have that chat, because by setting that example, then you sort of like encourage them to do the same. But more importantly, and this is from my experience as well, I think leadership needs to protect the rest of us um, from the external push to not do AAP the right way. Um, with the reduction in funding, with the re deprioritis uh, well, reprioritization um, and everything that is happening with the humanitarian sector, there's going to be like a stronger push for us to just do what is easy and not what is right. We've been seeing the impact of, you know, this focus on let's just be humanitarians and just focus on life saving. That's setting us back several decades on the work that we've been doing on community empowerment. Um, but the problem is, if you're in the front line and you're doing something and, and it's being dictated by, you know, the donors that are pushing it, you want your leadership to sort of like push back in your behalf. If our leadership is pushing back um, and protecting us from all of these external pushes, then you're free to actually do your job and do your job well. Yeah. And I think this is something that we always forget that, um, you know, we need that protection from leadership, from external uh, forces. <laughs> I feel like a, I'm a Jedi. Well, anyway, <laughs> I think I'll stop there before you give me the red flag. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alan. And I do think that role that leaders play is really critical. And as you said, you know, that reprioritization, we're going to do it the way we want to do it. And it comes back to what Gwen said at the beginning is, and others have said, we're not actually listening to what communities want. We're doing what it works for us as organizations. Jesse, from your perspective, um, Oh, wait, you've already, said, you've already answered this one. <laughs> I'm a little bit tired, too. I need coffee. Yeah, we'll yeah there's, a, there's a definite we'll need for coffee. Let me ask you a different question instead. <laughs> so we saw in the, sorry, the survey results and the interviews that the lack of common understanding about accountability to affected people and their role in AAP as leaders was a big challenge. So while we've got the training package for um, humanitarian country teams, in-country leadership, it was launched what more is needed to address that gap? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And I think we've actually heard many of the answers already this morning from the experience of the leaders that have come and spoken with us today. Um, so I'm not gonna really say anything new, but I think it's important for us to, you know, consider how do we take these things forward as a system? Um, there's some elements that can be dealt with at the country level by the teams that are on the ground. 
and there's some that need to be considered and, and reviewed and, and hopefully progressed uh, across, the, um, across the agencies and at the systems level. And so, you know, we have the issue of sustainable financing for AEP. It really struck me when I heard that there's 150 um, CFMs operating in uh, Cox's Bazaar, 200 in Somalia. Obviously, there's money for uh, accountability. <laughs> um, but is it being channeled in the right way? Is it being provided in a way that we can use it as a system by donors um, through the common funds, etc.? So this is very important because we can't be scrambling uh, with six-month contracts for an AAP advisor at the, um, within an HC, HC's office or at the collective level or, or with an organization that's providing that support in a specific country. So that's one that, uh, that needs to be taken up. Um, uh, the, the basic sort of support for, um, you know, surge capacity and, and uh, technical expertise at times to establish these. I thought there was really interesting points that this is actually something we should be doing maybe in advance of crises, so preparedness, working more effectively with local actors, um, local stakeholders who are going to be present um, when the shocks occur and can respond most quickly. Uh, can we look at ways of, of systematizing that in, in our approach? Uh, so I think that's really important as well. And, uh, and then I heard other things about, and this really struck me coming from WFP because we're, you know, obviously quite a large organization and, um, you know, we also are competing with everybody else for the funding that we receive from our donors and are always worried about assurance and, uh, you know, organizational risk. So this idea that there's a lack of trust amongst organizations to have complaints or feedback being processed by another because maybe they'll get insights mm -hmm. into what we're doing that we don't like. Um, that's something that we really need to tackle. So there needs to be one, a level of trust building amongst partners um, and how to, and we're working on that through our sort of, as the, as the ISC task force two and others and, and with the grand bargain, et cetera, but that's needs to go further. And then we need to look at the technical elements of that as well around data protection and ensuring that, um, you know, we are accountable to the people we're serving for the, you know, the safeguarding of their personal information and data. And how can we make that work most clearly? Uh, 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 smoothly. So there's a number of things I think we can do uh, going forward, but what's really heartening today is just to hear the, I mean, the progress has been made, but also the commitment of everybody around the table uh, to really trying to find ways of realizing this in practice. Thank Super. you. Thanks very much, Jesse. And I do think that trust building is something we've often talked about, but building trust takes time and it's very easy to destroy it. And I think the way that communities are not trusting us when they've got all these complaints and feedback mechanisms but they're not getting the feedback is one of those elements, but between organizations. And I think, how do we move beyond that competition that we've got so that we're really putting people at the center? Alan, what are some of the, the things that you think need to be done to address the gap between the kind of understanding of leadership and the, the role in AAP? Yeah, no, thanks, Manisha. I think, um, well, first, I really acknowledge the work of the task force in coming up with the training package. I think it's a, it's a really good effort to sort of like make sure that you know the tools are there for for our, our our colleagues in the country program to actually you know learn about how they can do things uh, in in the right way, but I think the critical shift that we need is learning about the impact of this at the country level. We've had a lot of these training packages, and and you know we're really good at like launching them. I think I think. Uh, <laughs> This is a challenge for you. Yeah. But how do you, how do you monitor the impact of this one? And I think this is something that we really need to make sure that we do. Um, check if it's actually being effective. And in, in our case, in our experience, like trainings are just one part of it. If you leave it as like a three-day training, it will be forgotten. So how do you create those platforms for learning, for joint feedback, um, create a community around it? I think that, that would be something that we would like to see. Um, you know the the ground truth solutions reports that we have you know receiving you must have heard from it in different sessions at the hnpw one of the things that they always highlight is this disconnect between the perspective of the communities and the actual work that is done and i think this is something that we really need to 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 address um with gts and chs alliance we're sort of like partnering and, and this is in a way to sort of like uh, resolve this whole issue about collective um, accountability we're trying to come up with a common accountability framework um, to sort of like we're all organizations whether you're humanitarian or not government or non-government to sort of agree on a common accountability framework and be sort of like um, uh, measured against that 
and hope, hoping that this would sort of like lead the way in terms of collective accountability. Um, it will be piloted in a few countries. I will keep you posted on the details. But I think this is one way to sort of think about it. You know, people don't think in sectors. They don't think of us as, you know, most of the time, you know, we get the credit for being thought of as the UN. We also get the, you know, the ramifications of being <laughs> thought of as, of the, as the UN. So they, they see us as, as, as one homogeneous uh, sort of like unit. So we need to find a way to be a bit better. But what I really wanted to sort of like just highlight is the, the, the trust deficit, um, which, you know, both Jesse and Manisha has uh, highlighted as well. The reason why it's been 20 years that we've been discussing AAP and we're still at this point is because we're shying away for the, from the uncomfortable discussions of why it's not working. And why do we shy away? Because we don't trust each other. And that's the problem. Like, even you listening to me, you probably don't trust what I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, I'm like, uh, that's not what LWF is doing from what I heard. <laughs> you know, it, it is just, in, I think it's in, uh, in our DNA to not trust each other. It's so strange. Um, but I think there has to be a way to shift it. And I, I think this is where leadership really has uh, a key role to play. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Alan. And there's a question in the chat. Is the common accountability framework the same as the one developed by the CHS Alliance? Yes, that's the Yes, one. that's the one. So if you know about that, that's great. Um, Christine, I'm going to come to you very briefly, and then I'm going to turn to questions from you. I've only got one in the online participants, but if there's anyone in the room who has a question, maybe if you can just, yep, so I'll come to you after Christine. So if you could just briefly tell us what needs okay. to be done to address the gaps. Thank you. Please. Um, allow me first to join my other panel members to congratulating the AAP Task Force for the launching of the training package. I believe this is going to be a game changer for the HCD and in-country leadership to have the tools, the, the, you know, the learning and the understanding um, to be able to have an effective um, integration and accountability of AAP. So three things from my side, strong commitment for the AAP, from the AC to leaders and, and cluster system and in-country leaders in committing to the integration of AAP. But for me, it is not just, a, not just a commitment, but as well as it has to be mandatory. Because, you know, we have been talking about this for many years, but there's not much of the commitment is there, but if we do it as a mandatory to include that in performance evaluation, in monitoring, in inductions of, of, of the staff, and these are explicitly mentioned in the IAC um, uh, commitment for AAP that was in December 2011. So we need to make sure that these are embedded across um, those commitments by the HCT. Um, second, monitoring and evaluation is always a challenge. This is what Alan has mentioned as well, that how do we measure the performance and the impact? So through monitoring and proper evaluation of what we do in the integration of AAP in all our work, we'll be able for us to measure its commitment, the performance and impact, and there is, you know, that buy-in from the leaders to be able to make sure that AAP is, is fully integrated. Last but not the least, um, we need to have a strong collaboration within HCT, cluster system, and government to strengthen policies. Because in many contexts that I have worked, the government counterparts does not have policies on AAP, PSEA. We have to make sure that we have to work with them in drafting and developing these policies so that these are a way of a collective approach, not just within the ACT and the cluster system, but also that important partner, which is the government. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much. And I do think in some countries that may be a bit challenging when there's not necessarily a government that is very accountable to their people or is causing problems and a conflict with their, their population. So I do think we have to balance that. But I do also think, you know, with governments, it's their responsibility to those in their territory to uphold their rights. And I think there's also a bit of a disconnect in the language that we often use in the humanitarian world. We talk about AAP, but on the development side, that's community participation. But how does that really play out? And bridging that, that nexus is really key. So the question I have online, and then I'm going to come to those in the room, is particularly to you, Gwen, but I'd, I'll ask others to also come in if they'd like. Would you say that having external parties handle complaints and feedback mechanisms or any types of allegations would help affected populations? Or would it put confidentiality at risk and be potentially harmful? 
given that you said it's, and many have said to, um, on the panel, that it's hard for agencies to trust the complaints made against them, and especially also when that, that feedback or those complaints come via others. So just to think about that, would a third party sort of um, external body be uh, easier? Which harkens me back, and now I'm going to show my age, um, to the Ombudsman project from the late 90s, which was very much about having sort of an independent mechanism for for feedback and, and accountability. Can I turn to you, please? Um, and just please introduce yourself. And then if anybody else has a question, I'll take a few and then we'll come back to the panel, please. Hi, uh, thank you so much. And, and thank you for the presentations this morning. I am Osma Wani. I'm from Islamic Relief Worldwide. Um, so I have one short question and one longer question. So um, just picking up on Christine Allen, um, and uh, just wondering, like when you say uh, monitoring and, and evaluation of how the training package would be a success, um, and coming from um, a place where we are hoping to develop our own training package linking uh, faith actors into um, responses for uh, displaced communities with um, a WF, with HIAS, um, with a, a connected to our refugee uh, GRF pledge. Um, what, can you just list maybe a few variables that you might use to measure the success? <laughs> because we are struggling. Um, <laughs> So that's one. And then um, now putting on my hat as a former diplomat from a country in Southeast Asia, where governments are in control of um, a disaster response, and they are the ones that decide which NGOs are allowed and not allowed. Um, and I see across HNPW, there's so many sessions, but there's very few uh, reps. Um, and reps, uh, diplomats need to be specific because they are generalists. So I, I wonder if there is a plan or a strategy to engage uh, government stakeholders, especially targeting the right ministries that will be passing on this information on uh, the training package to other NGOs. Super, thanks very much, Isma, and uh, I'll, I'll let you come back to that. And we've also got another question from Karen. It's very nice to read you, Karen, after many, many years. Um, what, how does the training package deal with the challenge of putting in place an integrated feedback mechanism? And how are leaders to be trained to look away from their own agency interests to ensure that people are truly put at the center? And I think that comes back a little bit to Christine, what you said about that need for it to be mandatory. And I'm actually surprised that none of you mentioned like, putting it into the job descriptions and the performance appraisals of like leaders and staff, because I think that's also where one of the big challenges is, because if you're not held accountable for it, for your job promotion, why would you do it? So I'm going to come back. I don't know who wants to answer. Gwen, maybe I'll turn to you first with that question around external parties or the other ones as well around um, government training them and also sort of how do we really get people to look away from their own agency interests or, or any of the ones you want to answer, Gwen? Thank you. Um, so maybe just to start with having an external complaint mechanism. Um, I think, you know, and in principle, that's not a bad idea. I think the, the challenge there is really having a partner who can uh, really understand the response. Um, so I think in a way, um, appointing an organization that's already working in the system makes a lot of sense um, because I think, you know, if every single organization in the Rohingya camps and set up a common feedback mechanism, it should be doable that one of the organizations can do it for the entire system. So, um, and it's, it's, it's possible. I mean, I worked in Palestine before Bangladesh and we, we did manage to achieve it. Um, I'm not sure to what extent it's still in place now, but um, it took it took a long time. Um, you know, uh, the UN had been uh, established there for a long time, and partners as well. But we we did manage to to consolidate and integrate the system and and find you know solutions to challenges like you know what if somebody calls up and um com you know says that they've been raped or something more serious and and you know the the complaint handler then has a you know an automatic switchboard stays on the line with the survivor and then there's a mechanism to make sure that that person is 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 uh, supported um, and, and and it's handled well so we built in confidentiality into the system so there's really practical ways of doing it um and i, I you know i'm hearing a little bit that the solution is leadership um and i you know, to one extent, I agree, but we're, you know, if I look at my, first of all, you know, you look at your terms of reference as a leader, 
you have to lead on making sure centrality of protection is uh, supported. You have to lead on making sure every single organization is respecting human rights. You have to make sure that there's security processes in place. We have to be leaders on SCA. We have to be leaders on AAP. And I'm not just saying that's wrong, but it makes it extraordinarily difficult when every single organization that's deployed that you're leading has a different system and they're not interoperable. So every time you try and tackle one of these principled initiatives, you're dealing with interoperability of systems and having discussions between an NGO and a UN organization about sharing data. So until we have some of those things, it's very difficult. I mean, we're, you know, you pick your battles, you try and do each one of them and you try and move it forward. But as I said, this is my third round of discussion on integrating AAP and the Rohingya camp. So we'll go at it again a third time. You know, the second time I even got financing and it still didn't work. So just to give you a sense, it's not so easy. So I just, you know, leadership and performance appraisals. I used to say exactly the same thing when I was sitting on those panels when I worked in Geneva. But really, you have to help us with this interoperability. Um, and I think if you could focus on that, I mean, training of a HCT, all I'll get is the HCT coming back to me saying, we agree. How do we do it? Because my agency is telling me to do the opposite. And the donor has put it in my donor agreement, the opposite. So, you know, I want to push back a little bit on that. Um, and then the other point I wanted to make was around the ministries and the capacity development there. I mean, we're trying to tackle that. Um, accountability doesn't translate into every language. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging conversation. But I think that's where the preparedness work comes in. That's where development actors need to buy this as a principle. And that this isn't something that we should be talking about in humanitarian response. It's a longer term initiative and it needs to be permeated across every single thing that a development or a humanitarian or a peace building actor does across the system. I'll stop preaching. Thank you, Manisha. Thank you very much, Gwen. And I, I think that point that you made is about the long list of responsibilities that you have as a leader is a very, uh, it's, a, it's a long, long list. And I do think that the role of organizations that are at the leadership level is really critical as well. So, but the IAC task force, you've been giving your marching instructions, work on that interoperability so that organizations are really able to do and share data in much more, not only data, but also systems to make it easier. Um, who on the panel wants to try some of those other questions? Can I just try one? Yeah, Alan, please. No, just uh, um, on, the, um, on member states, because I attended this uh, session on diplomacy, <laughs> humanitarian diplomacy, and you sort of like realize with all the crises that we're dealing with, the more majority of them require political solutions for us to do our work as humanitarians. And so because we're humanitarians, we don't want to engage in negotiations or or in humanitarian diplomacy, as they call it, but uh, you know, it's, it's a weird term, humanitarian diplomacy. But um, and so and so, we give them the the right to sort of negotiate in our behalf and that sort of thing. And then you realize, do they have the same definition of accountability as we do? Um, because these are from other sectors. And and as I mentioned, like you know, there's a problem with interoperability or, or definition of accountability and quality within our sector. Imagine going outside of the sector. Um, so you, these are diplomats, or government representatives, and then they sort of like you know negotiate in your behalf for access, um, agreeing, disagreeing on certain things without understanding how we define accountability or what we actually want. So I would fully support you know the comment that. I think when we when we talk about you know training tools, uh, maybe we should also get like a quick one for for member states and on how we define AAP in the language that they would actually understand. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alan. France, I'm going to turn to you and then see if anybody else. And also, there's another question in case anybody wants to. Would you please share some examples from your experience in sustaining accountability to affected people capacity of local or national counterparts? France, please. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to come in on the data part because I think that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, not only uh, save lives, uh, reduce waste, but also, um, you know, find a way to uh, deliver it effectively. Um, the interoperability is a problem, and I'm glad Jesse from WFE is here uh, because uh, what we've been discussing in Somalia is an automatic trigger. Uh, whenever, let's say, a, 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 a system-wide scale-up is, is declared, that every single agency is required to share data. Because what I've seen 
uh, people go back to their, um, um, their data protection as a way of not sharing data. Um, when I was in Nigeria, I signed a, an agreement between IRM and WFP to share data. Um, we immediately found out, like within three months, there were uh, 250,000 people that were not in need. That means we were wasting uh, um, resources and we were not effectively targeting the population. Um, we tried to do this in Somalia. It was extremely painful. Even though the document is signed between WFP and IOM, we have yet to fully implement it. Um, so what I've been pushing uh, my headquarters is an automatic trigger uh, that removes the excuse that all these agencies have. Oh, I have uh, data protection. We need a data uh, agreement before we can share the data. Mm -hmm. If it's automatic, then that excuse is removed and it's, 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 it makes it easier for us to effectively target the population, to, to, to identify who's, who's an IDP, who, who's affected by a disaster and how to, to deliver um, to them. Sorry, thank you very much, Franz. And I think that point about how do you get that interoperability, not only with UN agencies, but when you're looking at the broader system between UN, NGOs, the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, national civil society organizations, that gets even more complicated. And yes, data protection is often used as the excuse, but how do we get past that so that we're able to really put people at the center? Um, Christy, I know you wanted to come in, please, on the training and measuring success. Yeah, that's quite tough. <laughs> um, Ask so, for feedback on it when you get to the testing. Yeah, definitely. Um, we would have to consult as well the leaders. How do we measure you after this training? Um, but I think that it's just a training. It's just an online training. It's one of those tools. But the, we are looking at change of mindset. A cultural shift that takes years. So the realization was that um, two years ago when um, 13 chiefs of missions of IOM from Latin American region requested for an AP training, unthinkable 10 years ago that chiefs of missions, country directors would ask for an AP training. Um, I realized that we actually don't have an AP training tailored to leaders. four leaders. Um, what we have is a training to how do you do focus group discussions? How do you set up complaints and feedback mechanism? Or how do you make information um, materials, communication plans? And that's not necessarily the main tasks of a chief of mission or a country director. We had to take into consideration their level of influence, their, of course, their level of responsibilities, and on the level of influence, that's maybe somewhere, you know, it's very important for a leader to articulate what AAP is to government partners. Because it's true that we have different names for it from even amongst us uh, international organizations, how much more for government, but the principles of accountability are the same. It's accountability through the participation of people for people exacting accountability from the powers that be. But we needed to plant those seeds or we needed to start somewhere and that is to have a common understanding what AAP means. And that's what we're trying to do for the training. And the indicators can be as basic as, do we have more collective AP frameworks in country? <laughs> because as an out or an outcome of the training. That can be a tick box exercise, but it's also to measure maybe trust. And we have some tools, I think, developed by the IFRC and Community Trust Index. There are so many different tools that we could look into. Um, and so it's, it's gonna be a journey as well to find out um, the impact, but definitely the efforts are already there from other um, for efforts from everyone. Thanks very much, Christy. And, and I do think there's perhaps a lot of tools. So how do we make sure that leaders know which ones are the ones to use? Because having now done these AAP sessions in now three HMPWs, there's tools every year. And I mean, how do we get people to understand what they are? We're running out of time, but I, I know, we've got literally two minutes. Oh, we're on one minute. So I don't know if either of you wanted to come in like in 20 seconds on anything. Yeah. Um, 
I think, you know, in, in your materials, one of the issues you mentioned also is protracted situations. And this is what I wanted to touch upon because I think we didn't say much. That uh, 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 now we, we see that the, as early uh, in a refugee situations as we start uh, with inclusion, uh, meaning uh, trying to make the refugees uh, as soon as possible included into healthcare, uh, all other services, education, giving them uh, opp opp opportunities for employment uh, on par with citizens. Uh, is uh, going to actually really diminish the negative effects of the of the uh, long term and prolonged uh, displacement, and this is something that uh, just to highlight. Super, thank you very much. You okay? Wonderful. Did you want so, to come? Yeah, just, just super quick because you raised the point about this tools and the proliferation, and this is really an issue um, in terms of providing something that's uh, sort of direct and straightforward for country teams to use. Uh, so one of the things we've tried to do within Task Force 2 is to bring those together into a package, um, both of the work that we've been doing through this session, but also previous results groups, et cetera, that are put together. So tomorrow in our session, we'll be sort of giving a preview of this package. So it's more like an arrangement of the tools to try to address some of those issues. So like a cheat sheet to the package. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much to everybody. Nope. Okay. Um, France, there was a question about whether you can further explain data protection automation, but I'm going to let you type that answer to the, the panelists so we don't keep you from coffee. Firstly, huge thanks to all of the panelists, uh, well, Ugo in virtual, um, Christy, Gwen, France, Daniela, Christine, Jesse, and Alan. I think you've heard a really common set of challenges that everyone's seeing across the board a number of ideas of how we might be able to move forward on those, really thinking about how do we make sure that you've got that mandatory collective accountability to affected people approach, not only in HCD compacts, but also for leaders, making sure it's part and parcel of everything they do, what they're also being performance uh, appraised on, so that that's also there as well. The new online course is something that everybody should take in the pilot phase, provide your feedback, even on how you would measure success, I think. That'll be really um, important to do. The link is in the chat for those online, and the QR code is outside for those who are not. We really, I think, have highlighted that we've been talking about AAP for decades now, and we've often talked about putting people at the center, and yet our organizational systems and our approaches whether it's how we do the programming or how donors are funding us or how we go back to donors with really how do we change our programs based on feedback, we really need to make that shift to put people at the center. So it's not us as organizations coming in and saying, this is how we're going to do it, this is what we see as priorities, but really listening to people and understanding what their priorities are and making sure that their dignity is at the center of our responses so that we're really looking at it from their perspectives and not from ours. So that mind shift and that real change in how we're approaching accountability to affected people is really critical. We also need to make sure that we've got the financing to really support those accountability systems, but making sure that we're putting the money in the right places so that we're not duplicating complaints and feedback mechanisms in the hundreds, which still does shock me, those numbers from the Rohingya camps in Somalia. I mean. We, we need to be doing better. I mean, that coordination level's got to be there. But that also comes back to that element of requiring trust. The lights are going down because we're running late. I'm sorry. But we, I dragged it out at the beginning because there were so few people in the room. So I'm going to take a few more. Thank you, lights. Um, so I, I do think that issue about how are we putting the resources in the right places is really critical. And also making sure that we're providing the feedback to people about what we do with their complaints and feedback. because. If people complain they don't get any feedback, why would they trust what we're doing? So that trust building is not only amongst organizations so that we're better able to share complaints and feedback, but also how do we make sure that the trust with communities is really critical there. And so we really need to stop competing over the resources and really figuring out how do we bring those resources together in the most effective way. And that also links to the point about being prepared and really thinking about how are we putting in place accountability mechanisms in advance of crises. We know they're coming, we know they're cyclical, and yet we're not looking at what are the existing capacities, what are the systems that we can build on, and how do we make sure that we're doing that in advance of a crisis. And we also really need to be looking at how do we work with local actors and getting them to be part of those accountability mechanism, making sure that they are able to really bring their capacity and understanding of communities, make our systems more accessible for them in terms of less jargon, more 
um, interpretation languages, making it less um, internationally centered is really critical there as well. Another thing that we've talked about for years, but we just need to start putting that into practice. And while leadership plays a really key role, you can't put everything on leaders. I think, yes, there's a huge role for leadership. That's a great element and is a huge kind of trigger for making sure we have accountability, especially collective approaches. But we also need to make sure that organizations are coming to the table in a way that they're willing to share information and data and really at that organizational level going back and saying, what is it that we can do so that our information and our data is interoperable as we build that trust as well. And we really need to be thinking about that longer term of how do we bring in governments, development actors, so that we're talking about the same things in the same way so that we're able to all collectively work together on accountability to affected people. And then we will be looking to IAC Task Force 2 for that nice way to gather all those tools together so that when you're looking at collective AAP, you can find it. And there's also the operational principles and data standards for feedback mechanisms. Thank you, Ben, who's the coordinator of the IAC Task Force, um, for providing that long title. But that one is also supposed to um, help put together collective AAP feedback mechanisms, um, complaints and feedback mechanisms. But knowing that complaints and feedback mechanisms alone are not the sum of AAP, but it's much broader. And now, I'm sorry, but congratulations for the launch. Thank you very much to all of those online and to those in the room. And hopefully there is coffee for us. <laughs> they may have turned the machines on. Sorry for those online that you don't get coffee. But thank you very much. Apologies for going a bit later. And thank you, Gwen, for joining us from uh, DACA. Thank you very much. Have a good day.